Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Okay, I don't know if uh, this is amplifying or not, but uh, my name is Paul McConnell. I'm here from the uh, War Chief Sports Council. And on behalf of our uh, sponsors and supporters, thanks for coming. We have a great event tonight that we're sponsoring um, with respect to concussions. It's been in our uh, it's been in the news a lot the last few years, and we think there's uh, important to get as much information as we can to you. The title of our program tonight is called Concussion Awareness, a Parent's Guide to Facts and Safety. And I'm going to introduce our, our, uh, our host tonight, uh, West Hartford's own two for one director and co or founder, that is Steve Boyle. Um, we need no introduction, and he's going to uh, lead us through tonight. We have a wonderful panel of volunteers that we're very grateful that they're here for. Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, so certainly we always hope to be uh, a larger crowd, but you are the, you are the lucky ones to, to be here tonight. So thank you for coming out uh, on Thanksgiving weekend. Um, I'm gonna introduce our panelists, and if, uh, if you all wanna come on up and, um, and have, have a seat, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you as best I can. Um, we have Dr. Uh, uh, Jennifer Schwab. She's a practicing pediatrician at Rocky Hill Pediatrics and the mother of a freshman football player at Hall. She graduated cum laude from the College of Holy Cross in 1994 and the University of Massachusetts Medical School in 1998. She com uh, completed her residency at the Connecticut Children's Medical Center in 2001 and has been in, practice, in private practice since then. She and her husband, Jim, have three children and they volunteer every summer at the Hole in the Wall Gang Camp. Uh, she has worked with Dr. Long in creating the co-managed protocol for concussion management to facilitate collaboration between Connected children's and pediatricians in the community, which has streamlined care and recovery plans for our student athletes. Welcome, Dr. Schwab. Um, we also have with us on the panel, um, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Wang in a second, but I'm trying to find my other, uh, uh, Christina Martinelli, certified athletic trainer for Hart <coughs> with Hartford Hospital. Rehabilitation Network. She's one of the uh, trainers here at Connor High School. She graduated Magnum Cum Laude. I'm feeling particularly uh, non Cum Laude tonight. With her Bachelor's of Science in Athletic Training, Sports Medicine from Quinnipiac University in 2007. Ms. Martinelli also holds, <coughs> excuse me, the certification as a Strength and Conditioning Specialist and as a Clinical Instructor for the UConn Undergraduate Athletic Training Program. Ms. Martinelli received. The Ralph C. Manso Outstanding Off-Campus Approved Clinical Instructor Award from the University of Connecticut in 2013. Prior to her high school, Ms. Martinelli, Martinelli was one of the certified athletic trainers at Glastonbury High School. Ms. Martinelli has provided a number of community lectures with physicians in the area on concussions and provides clinical support to the Hartford Area Hospital Concussion Clinic. And our featured speaker tonight is Dr. David Wong. David is a sports medicine physician with more than 20 years of specialized care for youth athletes. He has a deep understanding of sports and the specific training regimens, uh, regimes and has worked with novice and Olympic athletes. Dr. Wong specializes in non-surgical techniques for muscul musculoskeletal conditions affecting the athlete and is active in concussion research. He received a grant from the U.S. Figure Skating Association to study the effects of spinning on cranial forces. Dr. Wang is the head team physician for Quinnipiac University, a U.S. figure skating national network physician, and the medical director for Kick International. So welcome to our panelists. I'm going to ask Dr. Wang to start, and I'll just do my best to facilitate a conversation on the context of what the purpose of tonight's uh, uh, panel is about. I know that there are um, parents in the audience who have had uh, children who have suffered concussions, and as an old coach in some of the works in youth sports, I always say I worry about brains and knees, um, especially in my work with, with girls. Um, and so what I'd like with that in mind is um, 
just recognizing that there's some, some fear and some myths around some of the things around concussions, that we have that as part of our context as well. So Dr. Vine, I know you wanted to start with some slides. Well, thank you. Um, I, I have to work on the resume, that's so old. But uh, nonetheless, we'll, uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about concussions. It's a pretty small group, so I hope that if there's any questions, we can certainly answer them for you. I'm just going to give you a, a, an abbreviated talk. I, I have these talks that are hundreds of slides long, and I, you know, this weekend, um, while watching my fantasy football team lose, I cut it down to about 70 slides, so I, and I'm going to fly through some of these, so I apologize if it's still probably too many slides. But I just kind of want to make sure that, you know, having taken care of concussions for so many years, I took care of concussions when nobody cared. Uh, when it was, it was considered uh, just such a boring injury, getting your belt wrong, it was no big deal. And we knew a lot back then, but it just didn't make the news. And when I was taking care of the college athletes, you know, I was a Big Ten taking care of the University of Minnesota, and, you know, every now and then I'd see high school, most of the time I'd just see college. And, you know, I'd say to the young player, you need to sit out this weekend. And they would then turn on the TV and they'd watch Troy Aikman or Steve Young clearly concussed in a game and going back in the same game and say, well, if it's good enough for them, why is it not good enough for me? And I kept telling them, it's not, I can tell you, it's, you know, someday this won't be a good idea. And I would continue to have to argue with parents. But now, with the, you know, publicity that we have, everywhere it's in vogue, people talk about concussions, and the pros are now following some rules. Now it's much easier, actually, for me to take care of younger people. But it, there was a day when it was really hard, because the pros did one thing, and the kids had to do another. Anyway, so things have changed, and so it's a lot easier actually to take care of concussions, although it's become more complicated at the same time. In the past, it was just, like I said, a, a rite of passage, getting your bell wrong, we just tape it up and send them back out. But now we're starting to recognize and manage them much better, in part due to the awareness that we have on the news, but also with legislation. And we have abundant research going on right now, and I'm doing some cool things myself that are really interesting. Um, and you know, we continue to make progress, but even though we're making progress and everybody knows about concussions and wants to talk about them, they're still being mismanaged daily. So this next is a short video, and I don't know if we're going to have sound for it, but... We're not trying. Okay, we do. This just happened. I mean, this happened in the last few years when we all cared about concussions. So this is just an example. So you can see him getting the Things like this still happen. So 
we still have room uh, to go. So now with concussions, I find it's, it's more interesting. Now we're starting to talk about them all the time. We're overanalyzing them. We're confusion as to what a concussion is. Uh, we're talking about liabilities now. People have worries about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. We're dealing with school accommodations and return and retirement from sport. So we have lots of topics now around the arena of concussions that we're talking about. And each one of these is a lecture in itself, but this is kind of where we're at right now, talking about all these things on a daily basis. So we can define the concussion, it's been defined many times before, and this is, you know, a biomechanical force is applied to the body which causes a transient you know, loss of, or change in neurologic function, and it usually is short-lived and reverses itself. It's just, it's just a definition. And again, people argue about these definitions, those of us in the, in the world of concussion, even disagree with what it really is a concussion now. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, as we learn more, we're starting to figure out that it's more complicated. But this is how we typically define it. Some blow to the body changing neurologic function. It is common. If we take a look at uh, Rio data, from which measures high school injuries, one out of every 10 injuries in high school is a concussion. Uh, again, CDC estimates 3.5 million sports-related concussions a year. That's probably too big a number, but it's still an enormous number. Yeah, the signs of concussion, we've sort of all heard them, but I, I just point them out again. They tend to have that vacant stare. They're slow in their responses. Don't pay attention really well. Disoriented, speech is off. They tend to say the same thing over and over again. That's what perseveration is, it's the same thing. They're incoordinated, maybe some nausea. Become emotional. I had a basketball player last year whose only sign was that they were laughing the whole time. So they can be crying, they can be laughing, with changes in emotion, there can be memory issues, and then one symptom is loss of consciousness. It doesn't make it worse, it's just a symptom. If you go by the athletes themselves and ask them what bothers them the most, they tend to say it's the headache, the feeling slowed down, difficulty concentrating, the dizziness, the fogginess, the fatigue vision, sensitivity, light, memory, and balance. That's just how, if you survey 10,000 athletes, that's how they kind of list out. Each person is different. I see odd symptoms. They usually get sent to me. These are people with their voice changing, sweating from half their body, turning from left-handed to right-hand, handed blood pressure changing, pseudo seizures, urinating more. Um, and then there's one case of someone that beat so bad that they became a math genius. So it, it's all, it, a lot of weird stuff can happen too. Some people break this into different groups, cognitive, and I just did this, you know, we've kind of gone past this, but I thought it was an easy way to just understand we have the cognitive symptoms, we have the physical, we have the emotional, and we have the sleep symptoms. All of these are important. Uh, the cognitive is what we notice in terms of thinking and memory. The physical is the visual and the headache. Emotional we just talked about. And sleep, often ignored in the world of concussion, but really important. Lots of people have sleep difficulties afterwards, and that can really impair their progress to get in terms of getting better when they can't sleep. Some sleep too much, and that's sort of more than more. The vestibular system is another system that we're spending more time with. Didn't used to spend that much time with it, but now we do in terms of balance and vision. We see that, you know, the way I look at it is that 67% the neural connections are involved in vision, and so you know a good way to kind of catch concussion symptoms is to look at vision. Now it's not 100%, but it is a good way of looking and catching a lot of concussions just by eye motions. With regards to vision, we have people that have trouble focusing and accommodating, the blurry vision, the double vision, light sensitivity, the dysfunction of the eyes, I, once in a while, I see someone with one eye that goes one way and the other goes the other way. I call it frog eyes. So lots of things can happen to the eyes that will help you pick out concussion. These symptoms can affect their ability to read and write and take notes and even walk in hallways. So they're important to note because it affects basically their whole life. Balance, common, or it's common after a concussion. We see a lot of balance issues. I won't go into great detail about this, but just understand that that uh, it can be severe. I once had a gymnast who couldn't walk without holding a wall for a year. Um, you know, so these balance issues can be profound. 
Again, I talked about some odd symptoms. We do see heart rate changes. We do see people that become orthostatic in terms of hypotension. They stand up and get dizzy. I've had people come in with burning hot ears. All sorts of different symptoms can occur. These are more of the odd ones. And then we sort of have to deal with post-concussive syndrome. Those are the people that have had prolonged symptoms. And understanding what that really means. Some people define it as concussion over 30 days. Others say it's concussion over 90 days. But when we deal with pediatrics, younger people, an average concussion is 20 plus days to begin with. So in a pediatric patient, I think it's a little bit different. That being said, we see it for more prolonged symptoms in the females. And I actually have a paper to be published that maybe explains why that occurred. We have the psychological issues. Those people that have had some mental health issues tend to do a little worse. People that previously had ADD, things like that, tend to do a little worse. I believe there's a microscopic, macroscopic injury, which is this tiny little microbleed that you can't see, except with a special imaging called SWI sequencing on the MRI scan. And that, of course, isn't a concussion anymore. But I believe that we've missed some of those in the past and just called them bad concussions. There's genetic factors involved. I've experimented with a couple genes recently, which have been really cool in terms of helping me figure out why some people have prolonged symptoms. Again, we talked about females. We talked about the injury type. This is an article that is yet to be published called Overlapping Concussion Syndrome. And this is where I took a look at people that were hit and then had another blow while they were still getting better. Most people call that second impact syndrome, but it's not. And it gives them a prolonged healing course. So some of these people that have post-concussive syndrome have just been hit too many times. And then misdiagnoses. I see people all the time with chronic headaches after a concussion. It's called post-concussive syndrome. And really, they just have cervical strain, so things like that. Cumulative injuries is where a lot of people are worried about now. In the old days, we called it dementia pugilistica. And now, we talk about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And the other thing I talked about is overlapping concussion syndrome, which is what I was outlining earlier. And then second impact syndrome, which is a rare event that causes significant problems. In terms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, again, we're not going to see this. This tends to be people that have been through the ringer, like professional football players, wrestlers, things like that. And we're still collecting data on these people. But of course, a lot of people are concerned. The movie Concussions was not about concussions. It was about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so there's a lot of worry about this. And it's going to continue because still so much is not known. Why do people have CTE? There could be a genetic component to it. Certain people have a certain genetic defect that may be in part due to it. People say, well, it's due to the number of concussions. But it probably isn't. And it might be more just blows to the head. Looks like this. I won't go into great detail. Has genetic contributions. Overlapping concussion syndrome is what I was talking about. That's a person that's getting better from a concussion, not all the way better, suffers another blow to the head. Not a concussion, just a blow to the head. And that does triple their healing time. And it's just results of a study that I did on this. Other insults. I have seen prolonged symptoms or when people have had a concussion, they're trying to rest and get better. And then their family goes into a divorce or they were, you know, they started missing schoolwork or people have had elective surgeries and actually had, you know, dental procedures and teeth pulled and all the symptoms tend to worsen. It's like another insult. Second impact syndrome is that thing that you hear about on the news. It's a very scary thing. It doesn't happen very often. But that usually is a blow when still symptomatic from a concussion that leads to brain swelling and potentially catastrophic injury. Imaging, everybody asks, can we take pictures of it? The answer is not really. You get CT scans in the emergency room. They don't show anything. MRI scans really don't show anything. There are specialized MRI scans that we're experimenting with, confusion tensor imaging, things like that, where we might be able to start to see something. But really, all the normal studies that we have to offer the regular population, we don't see anything. 
There are some, again, these are more research things, but DTI, MR spectroscopy has been used to find changes in chemicals in the brain. And it's interesting work, but not yet ready for the public. This is a DTI picture here. People are also looking for that magical blood test, bioenzymes and markers. They've started out with S100 and gone through the gambit. Everyone's still trying to find the right marker, have yet to do so. This SNTF was used in the National Hockey League in a study to show that if it was elevated enough that they took longer to heal. There's research being done in England where there's a panel being done where you can try to pick out from this panel, not just one marker, but through this panel, which person has a concussion. Again, 90% of the cases, we know who has a concussion. So having a blood test isn't really that helpful, although some of these blood tests may someday be able to prognosticate how long it takes to get better. And again, different biomarkers are the tau protein as well. I just want to make a point at this end of the slide is that not all head injuries are concussions. Some people, I commonly see people in the clinic, I get kicked in the head and I have a bump on my head and it's sore right there, I must have a concussion. And really they have a bump on their head and a sore head from getting kicked in the head. And it's not a concussion. So we are sort of reaching a point where everything is a concussion. I see people at these games, I see people at football games, everybody's trying to guess who's getting the concussion. It's almost a secondary thing going on on the sidelines, which is seemingly more interesting to other people. So how do we treat them? Again, we can talk about the basics. The basics are on the field management. You have to take a look at these people. You have to evaluate them and get them out of the game and practice. Everybody agrees. We disagree a lot about a lot of things, but we all agree that if you think there's a concussion, you got to get them out of harm's way. The mainstay of treatment remains cognitive and physical rest. How much rest and what type of rest is what's being debated. Uh, there was a day not that long ago when some people believed that you just locked them up in a closet, it was dark, took away all sensations, and somehow that would help them. And I saw some of those patients and they actually were going crazy. I mean, it was like solitary confinement. There are new studies coming out right now showing that a certain level of activity versus absolute rest is actually associated with a little faster healing and certainly no worsening of healing. So we're still working out what is rest. And then, of course, we have to deal with return to school, which is a big issue. Uh, schools have, I mean, had to deal with people coming back with a lot of limitations. And some schools have been really eager to help and work with these people, and others have, uh, find it very difficult and don't have the resources. So we do have to deal with this quite a bit. Uh, the appropriate school notes have to be written that, that match what, what the school can do, and that's always a challenge. Treatments can also include physical therapy. Most of these people, if you think about their head being accelerated and having a concussion, also have a cervical injury. So treating their necks can be helpful. It helps them with the headache that comes usually from the back and wraps around the sides. It feels like a man squeezing their head. The vestibular issues, we do the vestibular therapy for it. That's the eye issues. And then, as I said before, some degree of exercise can actually help people as well. So initially, most people would recommend a couple days of rest, again, depending on the severity of the injury. We sometimes have to talk about medications for people. We also just talked about the rehabilitation. And some people will look at supplements to try to prevent um, injuries. This is, this is also debatable literature, but there is some evidence that might be helpful. So in terms of medications, I said sleep is critical. If I have a patient that cannot sleep, I somehow have to help them sleep. I don't give sleeping pills, that's what the wrong thing to do. But sometimes I use certain types of medications that have side effects that make people sleep, and I find that once they get better sleep, they get better a lot faster. People who have pain, I don't often treat with pain medicine, but occasionally it has to be treated. Some people have really significant nausea and vomiting. For them, I also have to give medication, usually to help them with, with nausea. The ADD, 
Symptoms can be pretty profound afterwards, and sometimes that will require treatment as well. Some people will describe a cognitive fogginess, no, no clarity in their head. We certainly have had good response using medications for that. Memory has not been something that we've had a lot of medications for, but I have experimented with a couple things that seemingly do help. So there are some supplements that may help with memory. And then, um, as I mentioned before, there are some genetic mutations that uh, may, if I deal with that mutation, I seemingly can get much better results as well. So there's certain supplements and medications that we can be used, that can be used. In terms of the supplements, most people talk about the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, they have been shown in some studies to, to decrease our, the symptoms and potentially prevent injury. Those studies were funded by the company that makes the fatty acid, unfortunately. And the branch chain amino acids, again, I'll pass by this. This gets into the how marijuana may be helpful, but we'll pass on that. Um, so the recovery is usually Gradual, although sometimes it's a light switch. Uh, you can get symptom spikes that occur. A recent study has just come out in the past few months showing that these spikes um, do not change the, the healing rate. Uh, they tend to get better at the same rate. They just intermittently, one third of patients will have these spikes when they get worse. The genetics, again, I just, uh, the things that people have looked at before, this apoprotein E, um, this one has sort of been around for a long time. This may have a role. And then there's a host of other uh, genes that people have looked at. None of them have clearly been associated with a concussion. So how do we prevent the concussion? Again, on this slide, we can just not have heads and it would be a lot easier. But given that we do, we have to look at the common things, the simple things. We have to look at equipment. We have to look at conditioning, the rules, and how these rules are enforced. Certainly hydration is helpful. Um, the pediatric athletes nowadays are overscheduled. Too many teams, too many sports, too many days. They tend to get weak, tired, and more vulnerable to injury. And potentially the supplements that we talked about before. People who have strong necks have been proposed to have less likelihood of having a concussion. So a lot of work, and people have done a lot of work saying, well, let's just make the kids stronger, and they won't get concussions. Unfortunately, that hasn't been proven in studies, but uh, still, people still believe it, at least it's something they can do. And these guys are just insanely, they have no necks. The interesting, I took care of one of these guys. Um, he was once natural, but he isn't anymore. Uh, equipment, people have looked at helmets back in the old days, as you can see, they just took a student, usually a freshman, put a helmet on him, ran him in a wall, and so you see what happened. And that was how they tested them. Now we have advanced testing. Usually the testing is referred to as the Virginia Tech Institute where they, where, they, uh, where they are checking helmet technology. So what do we find? What, do we, what are the common questions that are often asked of us? Is there a concussion-proof helmet? Is there evidence that a mouth guard can protect against concussion? And do these aftermarket force protection materials that you put over your helmet, do they, do they reduce concussion? And do those indicators that you can put on the chin straps and the mouth gear on the helmet, do they help? So let's go through that. The, in terms of protective equipment, the threshold for a concussion is elusive. In other words, if we take 80 Gs, which is a big hit, less than half a percent of those people get a concussion. And so if we look at just kind of concussions as are measured, or blows that are measured to the head, we see that they can be between 60 and 170 Gs. And there is no relation. The person at 60 Gs can get the concussion, the person at 100 can have no concussion. So now you see that you have these indicators and they mark when you have a certain amount of force on there. And although it's a warning that there was a big blow, it does not mean there's a concussion. And in fact, someone that's under that threshold could be sitting there with a concussion and they don't even ring the little bell or the little light doesn't go off. So that's elusive still. Um, the mouth guards, to, to go back to the other one, since I don't have any more there. The mouth guards have not been shown to be helpful. The aftermarket reduction materials are not uh, okayed by the helmet manufacturers, so that's sort of what we'll call illegal. And as I said before, the, uh, the indicators don't really help. Other questions that people ask, is there any evidence that an uncomplicated concussion can lead to long-lasting or permanent impairment? 
And is there a proven proper way to manage a concussion? Several studies have looked at this. If you just take, go back, uh, looking at neurocognitive studies from people that had uncomplicated concussions, after a week, there were no measurements of anything abnormal afterwards, so there was basically no evidence of any prolonged injury after a concussion has been resolved. Uh, in terms of management of concussions, we do, again, we are adamant about the removal from activities. I mean, the fact that you have a school with athletic trainers is critical. Uh, the athletic trainers are right there at the scene and they can really help. And in fact, we know that the quality of care for athletes is better when athletic trainers are present. So they can remove them from activity and that saves them some of those second blows and some of the bad stuff. We have to, you know, still evaluate them. They have to usually rest them. Again, we have to define what rest is. And then we will grade them back to school and activities. And we do not want people to return to sport when they're still symptomatic, although there are some minor, minor uh, changes to that depending on the sport. But as a general rule, you don't want to do that. Is there a vulnerable window after a concussion where you may be injured again? And do football concussions lead to neurodegenerative disease and CTE? So, the vulnerable window. We certainly see through some studies that brain chemistry has been altered for a month, but it hasn't been correlated to being extra, to extra vulnerability. We take a study from way back when here in 2003, which is still a good study, which showed that the majority of football players that had a repeat injury had it in the first 10 days. And therefore, if you could pat, wait past 10 days, you're much less likely to have a repeat injury. 10 days of being better. Long-term issues in football are still figuring this out. Studies are being done left and right. If you take a look at uh, NFL players from the 59 to 88, and you look at their all-cause mortality, it's 50%, it's 56% you know, less of what you would expect for people of the same group, right? The suicide rates are lower. And so therefore, their belief is that there's less midlife death in those people that are active in football than those who didn't play football, hence why they got older and then had more likelihood of neurogenerative disease just from being old. Other studies have been done. Uh, high school football players from 46 to 56, and they compared them, compared them to classmates, and they found no increase in neurogenerative disease. And then a survey recently of uh, 500 retired NFL players taking a sort of neurocognitive test at home found that maybe a third of them had some type of cognitive problem. Unfortunately, that study had no control for the same age group, so it's hard to, to, to totally interpret. So I'm asked this every day, how many concussions before it's time to retire? And I continue to say the same thing. I have no answer. I have one person on the Olympic team with one concussion that I would never let play again because it was so horrific. Learning how to talk and walk and everything else. And people at Harvard with seven who are doing extremely well. So it's not a number. It has to, you have to kind of understand the whole picture. You gotta understand what kind of force was applied, how long it took to recover, were there any significant damage afterwards, and what's the risk of the activity. And you have to factor all these things in, and even then, you don't have an absolute answer. So to summarize, concussions can be obvious or they can be very insidious to diagnose. They can have a multitude of system, symptoms that we talked about. The initial management is the relative rest that we talked about. The vast majority, 85% of these concussions, resolve with an uncomplicated course. And those with the prolonged, more complicated symptoms may require interventions such as therapy or medications and maybe scholastic accommodations as well. So I have a closing couple thoughts. And that is, is concussions are not just a bunch of compartments and we just put people into a little pigeonhole and you know, in the old days, they tried to say that's a grade one, that's a grade two, that's a grade three, and we tried to just give them a category and then they, you know, say that we knew what was going to happen afterwards. It's not that. It's not that easy. It's not a bunch of impact tests. Everybody.
once an impact test result, like somehow that's magically the answer. It is a tool, and to be honest with you, it's a pretty small tool, but it's a tool that we use, but by no means is it, is it, does it answer the question for us. People cheat on their baseline tests. People have been shown to have decreased test scores after they sprain their ankle. Uh, there are all sorts of other issues, so we can't, you know, the world that we live in, everybody wants a lab test and MRI. If, I think every patient would be happy if they had an MRI and a lab test, it, just because it doesn't matter what I say. Um, unfortunately, it's not so simple. Uh, these, these impact tests are, like I said, a tool, but they are not the answer to everything. Here we go, what's the impact test say? If the impact says, says you know, they, they have ones that used to have a green light, and a yellow light, and a red light. And then they would just look to see if the light was green, or the light was yellow, or the light was red. Red, you can't play. Green, you can play. But it wasn't, it's not like that. They're, concussions are people. They're individuals. So as much as we want to categorize them, we want to follow an algorithm, um, we want a specific return to learn, to learn, return to learn program, as much as we want a, you know, a return to play program, we just can't do that. You have to understand that these are unique people, unique lives, with their own goals and plans for life. And we have to learn these so that we can better care for these people. And then knowing these facts helps us return to life as opposed to learn or play if you have to return to life. Because there are different situations for which you, the rules kind of change. Um, and I won't go into them now because I think I've gone over my time. So, I believe that's what I have for you today. Thank you, Dr. Wong. So, Dave, how many slides was that? Were you, uh, no? That was, that was quite impressive, I, I have to say. No. Tell, can you tell me exactly what CTE stands for again? Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Do you think that that could be the new impact? If someone can say that, then they're no longer concussed. <laughs> um, so, look, I, as a longtime school counselor and a coach of many different sports, I have a thousand questions now. And uh, but I want to be conscious of time and know that folks came here today with probably specific questions. If I can, though, just for the panel, get a show of hands of how many came today because you had a child at some point who was concussed or you have been concussed yourself at some point. Okay, and others are here just um, wanting to learn about prevention, perhaps. Great. Um, so I wanted to start the question, and, and I suppose if, if anybody from the panel wants to answer, maybe we can start with you, Christina, is that um, the first thing we often hear from trainers is, um, I think you're concussed, but you might want to go to the emergency room. No? So, I've heard that before, so I would like to hear from you why you shook your head no, because I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, like Dr. Wong was saying, we've come a very long way in a very short period of time when it comes to concussion management. I mean, I think I went through two revisions of the law and started without a law. So, you know, when anybody hears brain, yes, it's serious. Um, yes, it could be scary at times, um, but a lot of times they're still going to be okay. Um, just like any other injury, um, you just need time to take its course. Um, there are red flags. Um, in, you did get some handouts in a, in, on the uh, suspected concussion head injury. Um, those would warrant uh, an emergency room visit or a 911 call, and a lot of them, loss of consciousness is the first thing. Um, a long time ago, loss of consciousness was the only definition of a true concussion. So that's why a lot of people did go to the emergency room, or sometimes they'd have the smelling salts and then they'd get back up and play, but um, th that was more scary because you have a physical change of state. Um, repeated vomiting, unequal pupils, numbness or tingling, or, or weakness in the arms and legs. Uh, decreased uh, responsiveness, slurred speech. Those would warrant emergency room care because maybe there's something else going on. But overall, um, concussions are, they can be scary. Um, you're, you always want the best for your child. Uh, you want to make sure they're protected. Us athletic trainers feel the same way. I say I have 650 children. Um, time will heal it, and, and unfortunately there isn't that time frame. But 
as long as we get the intervention, the athletic trainers and coaches and parents becoming aware, because unfortunately athletic trainers aren't everywhere. Um, even on our own sidelines, I could be at a football game and something's happening at soccer or soccer practice and something's happening at football. So the proactiveness of our coaches, we rely on a lot. Um, removing them and getting them that care will ensure that they'll be okay. Thank you for that. Um, and I can assure you that there is an awful lot of training that goes on each year. Um, and we have our athletic director, new athletic director with us today, Jason Siegel, and he could speak to the fact that each season coaches are required to go through uh, concussion awareness and, and protocols. So um, questions from the audience, though, that uh, you have for any of the panelists? So this is my life, right? This is what I do every Sunday night as I'm watching football. I get all the calls driving back from the soccer game or the hockey game or the football game, and this happened on the field. And um, as Dr. Wong and Christina have both spoken to, there's no picture to take for concussion. There's no blood test to do. And that's why a trip to the ER is not typically warranted. So I always start with common sense. Does your child know their name, phone number, address? Are they acting normally? Are they eating and they're drinking? You can certainly give a dose of Tylenol or Motrin. You can put ice on something that hurts. And then you would just watch them. And that's all we would do in the ER. There's no evidence that waking them up every hour overnight is going to make anybody safer or more rested. And what I say is, listen, it's Sunday night at 7 o'clock. Put them to bed like you normally would. Check on them once when you go to bed. And then if in the morning when they wake up, they have symptoms. They have a headache. They feel foggy. They feel a little dizzy. They feel a little nauseous then don't send them to school, call me, and we'll see you in the office. If they wake up and they're totally fine, this is that fine art of medicine, not the hard science. In all likelihood, it's probably not a concussion. It's the persistence of symptoms. It's that 24 to 72 hours of persistent headache or some type of symptoms. And if you did get this handout, there's a great list. But the top 10 common ones are the headache, the sensitivity to light or noise, feeling foggy, mentally feeling slowed down. Those are the signs of concussion, and if you're not sure, right, I saw three concussions in my office today, but one kid literally had slid in gym, whacked his head in the wall, had a big goose egg. I'm not sure that's a concussion. I think he bumped his head, but what I said to mom is, I'm not 100% sure. Don't bring him back to school. Just relax. Go outside. Walk. Play. If in the morning you still complain of a headache, give me a ring, and we'll talk about our plan. So I think it's a very dynamic. It's, a, it's always evolving. It's not static. It's not black or white. But my main point to parents is when in doubt, sit it out. Because if the kid, if we decide he just bumps his head and then you let him go to hockey practice tonight and then he gets another hit, even if it's not a concussion, those two cumulative hits can turn, if not into a concussion, gosh, into something that looks like it, acts like it, and can really prolong recovery. The one other just sort of, um, the red flags are really not for concussion, right? Those would be for a true brain injury or brain bleed, you know, like you saw, see on TV. Um, but there are some red flags in what we use medicine or cautions that kids, certain kids are going to be more at risk for prolonged recovery or more at risk potentially to have a concussion. And those are the kids with underlying attention deficit problems, anxiety or depression, chronic sleep problems, a prior history of a concussion, or chronic headaches. So if your kid falls into that category, I probably would be even a little bit more cautious about what's an extra day. You know, you don't run on the track on a broken ankle to make your ankle get better faster. So if you break your brain, you need to rest it. That's great advice. One of the, the toughest situations I had was as counselor and coach with a young girl who was uh, snowboarding, and she had a helmet on, she fell back, banged her head, said, oh, that hurts. But she had a sinus infection, and for a week, the parents attributed the concussion to the sinus infection. And, um, then she missed about three months of school because of that. So I think sometimes what happens is we, we have a tendency to want to attribute symptoms to something else. So how would you speak to that in terms of advice for parents? Again, if you're not sure, then come to the pediatrician. And I think that's really where you should start. 
um, is your pediatric provider or healthcare provider. Um, you know, a lot of us, even in general pediatrics or family medicine, we just see concussions a ton. Let us make that call. If you're not sure, then let us make that call. Yes, I actually had something similar happen this season where um, freshman girls, uh, volleyball player, <laughs> um, of course they love to pay attention on the sidelines, I swear, gets knocked in the head uh, during practice, sideline, or at a game, I can't even remember. And she has a history of migraines. And I'm on the phone with her mother, and she goes, well, and kind of both of us on the same page was like, I can't see how a 14-year-old girl has all the speed to come off and truly cause a concussion. But I looked at her mom and I said, listen, Treat it as if you were going to treat for migraines, because that's what you know how to treat. I said, if she wakes up tomorrow, you've done everything that normally resolves a migraine, and it doesn't, call your pediatrician. And then we started that ball rolling. So recognizing that she, she did have the underlying condition, treat it. If it doesn't get better, then involve it. Because being a freshman, I don't have a lot of experience with her. Parents are with her 24-7. I only have the athletes for two hours of the day. A uh, pediatrician has been following her her entire life. So, you know, I can only guide and I'm not going to downplay, I'm not going to overplay either, but using all the tools, because again, we can all agree that it's individualized, then we were able to get the care that she needed. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, there really is no test, right? I think impact is really geared for high school kids, but as Dr. Wong mentioned, they sandbag it, and it's not, um, I don't think it's really reliable enough to use. It can be helpful, it can be useful, especially in a high school athlete, but on the broad spectrum, there is no baseline test that kids can take to give you that sense of how recovered they are. It's, it, it's a great question because people want to be able to do something, and I think that it's something that you can do. I just, I would just want you to understand it. It's not this, it, it's this. Um, it maybe helps out a little bit in some cases. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I could go my whole day without a test. Um, but that being said, like I said, the world that we live in, a lot of people, you know, want to be proactive and they want to do their best and know that they're doing the best for their child and they feel better doing impact tests. And, and for them, I, I, I don't discourage it. Um, if they want it test, we certainly can, you know, it can be done for them. And I have no problems with it, but it's just that it has a lot of um, shortcomings. And we just have to understand that and not look at it like somehow it's the magical answer. Yes? How often are you having kids that are basketball? I go to the tournaments and you see some girls are wearing these headbands on their head for concussions. Yeah, unfortunately, they have shown to, to decrease the concussion rate. And if you look, uh, the studies were done with soccer players, they did the same thing. And like I said, some protection is better than no protection, but it is really, it's almost impossible to measure. So I, I designed my own band a, a couple years ago, which, which could absorb force better. Um, and then I took the other brands and I, and I actually took it to the lab in, in New York and in, in New Jersey where they, they, they measured them. And I found that they were really poor <laughs> across the board. So I don't think you could look at it as, um, as a significant amount of help. And the worry is, is that if someone wears it, that somehow they play with a little more risk and a little bit more aggressively because somehow I have this headband on. And that unfortunately has led to some increased injuries with those people wearing it as opposed to decreased injuries. Mm -hmm. So if you played exactly the same and didn't change the way you played and you wore it, and certainly it wouldn't hurt. Um, and now there's new stuff being looked at, I don't know if anyone's heard about this, where <laughs> you actually engorge the brain with blood by putting a tight collar on the <coughs> neck and, de and the increased volume, venous return. So you have arterial blood that goes up, but the venous blood doesn't come down. And, 
and then you somehow, because of this extra layer of fluid in the brain, when it sloshes back and forth you can decrease concussion. And believe it or not, they're doing studies on this right now. Any takers on wanting to participate in the study? You know, your point is a good one because as someone who coached girls lacrosse, that's been the big discussion about whether or not to add helmets for the girls' play. And I'm a big proponent to say no, that I think it's going to increase aggressive play and we're going to see an increase in concussions. And there's folks on the other end of the argument that would say, well, that's crazy because they have a helmet on. I just think to your point about wearing the headbands, it's going to increase and we're going to see increase in other parts of the body as well. Agreed. And to be clear on all the headgear, the soft headgear and the hard headgear, to get a concussion, at least the simple way to look at it, is your head has to accelerate. It moves from here to here and it moves quickly. The brain kind of wiggles, wobbles back and forth inside there. If you're wearing a helmet and you get hit from the side, like people in the NFL do every Sunday, their head accelerates just like anybody else's head. And although they don't get a skull fracture, hence why they have a helmet, they still slosh the brain around and they still get concussions. So as long as your head's flying around from side to side, with a headband, without a headband, with a helmet, without a helmet, you're still getting a concussion. You talk all about technology change inside the helmet. I mean, when I was a freshman in high school, we had campus wedges inside the helmet. You're an old man. And we had a drill that we had to go to practice called the bell ring. And what you did was you cracked his head with somebody as hard as you possibly could in order to get to the next guy. That stuff doesn't happen anymore. Thankfully. But that stuff doesn't happen anymore. So shouldn't we see over time fewer older people in the CT, the concussion movie, and this kind of stuff? Shouldn't we see that kind of plateau at some point? Yeah. This is a popular press. I was believing that this is an explosion that's going up and will just continue to go up as long as kids play any kind of sport. Well, as you, when you played with your canvas helmet, just like I did, we didn't. It wasn't a lot of problems. It's a. Is that we didn't care about concussions. We didn't recognize them. We didn't identify them. They didn't even count. That's getting your bell rung. You know, walk off the field on the wrong side. Ha ha. And you got your bell rung. Now you know how to play football. So, with with this awareness has come recognition, and with recognition, we're seeing many more numbers. Right. So the, these this escalating number. This could have been the same number. It's all along. But because of our awareness, we're identifying it more and more. I mean, now it's getting to the point where I'm seeing kids who don't have concussions, but they think they might. You know, and, and I mean, so it, the pendulum has swung the other way. So I think, you know, as you said, are we seeing more and more? You know, why should we be seeing more and more when we're changing the rules? We only have hitting one day a week and football, blah, 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 blah. Because we're much more sensitive to it. And I don't think. I mean, I did those drills that you're talking about, and everybody was concussed, right? But we didn't recognize it back then as being a problem. Uh, they just had, you know, a headache for a few days. I also wonder. I mean, this is just me spouting out. I remember kids in school back then who dropped out of school a lot more than they do now. You know, just they had decent grades, and then they had really bad grades, and then they just dropped out of school, and you never saw them anymore. And I wonder, and I'm just wondering. If any of those guys were just really concussed and never got better and it was never recognized, never identified, and they just dropped out of school, now everybody goes to school no matter what, and now we recognize it. It's just a thought, um, but it's something I wonder about. That same generation that played that way, you know, people just dropped out of school. I want to be conscious of time. And, uh... Dr. Wang, you had a chance to give closing thoughts when you gave a presentation. Dr. Schwab or Christina, do either of you have any sort of closing thoughts for the audience that you'd like to share, um, you know, in terms of messaging or uh, feedback for, for folks? I mean, we don't do these concussion talks to make you fear that your athlete shouldn't be playing sports. Like, sports are great. Um, doesn't deter them from playing hockey, not to deter them from football. Like, being part of, I, I was a 
three sport athlete growing up and being part of an athletic program was amazing. And you know, you have the brotherhood of football that I sit on the sidelines every week for. Um, just be safe and we only have one brain and, and one thing that we need to work with and it's all still fun and it still can be fun. We just need to make sure that we do it safely. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. You guys you really have a national expert in the room. He's just phenomenal. He's been a great mentor to so many of us in the community. So just know that we have a wealth of resources. The fact that Hartford Healthcare provides these phenomenal athletic trainers. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot just preparing for tonight about the quality of the athletic training that you have on the sidelines is really an absolute gift. Um, lastly, I think what I'd like to close with is in my experience, and I'm sure Dave has many more stories than I do, we have a lot of kids who don't get better, and that's my take home to you. The kids who don't get better um, have three things going wrong. One is they push through. They just want to take that math test. They just want to show up to band because they're you know, playing an inter or like they're just, they need to play their tuba and then they'll go home. Um, so they're pushing through their symptoms, and that's prolonging their recovery. So that's number one. Um, number two, they have one of those sort of pre-existing conditions, a prior concussion or headache, um, chronic headache disorder that puts them at risk. And um, three, they don't sit down during the game. So when you look at the film from the game, there's no big hit. You're like, I don't understand how did you get a concussion. But those little hits add up. So when in doubt, sit it out. When in doubt, take an extra day off from school. Rest. Go for a walk, get fresh air. Don't lie in a dark room. But just, I'd rather you err a little bit on the side of caution with recovery to really, and if you do, most kids will get better more quickly. Great. Everything they said is true. I'll just sort of elaborate on them. If you take a look at uh, college athletes and females, in, in more specifically, you'll find that the girls that play sports, the average GPA in college is higher than the girls who don't play in sports. So there are oodles of benefits to sports. Oodles. There's, we're not talking about it very much, but I, I want to elaborate that it actually shows up in the numbers that, that GPAs are higher for girls that play sports. Um, in terms of, you know, when in doubt, sit them out, that, that goes without saying. You, 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 if it's confusing, if it doesn't seem right, then, then you, have to, you have to be careful. I have moms that come in and it, they find things that I would never find, like here's a picture of Joey and here's a picture of Joey now, and see his smile is different. And I'm like, really? And, and she, but she knows, right? So I always say, to be honest with you, moms know. I mean, the kids that are right are the kids not right. I, I'll tell you, there's a 100% correlation. When mom thinks they're back, then they're back. When mom thinks something's off, then they're probably off. And so, you know, not, not to, we talk about the dads in here, but moms have always been dependent. They usually want to come to the clinic. Um, and it, it, so, I mean, if, it, if they don't seem right, take the safe road. Have them evaluated. It won't hurt, and it could very well help. Um, you have questions, you, your, your child has a question, you know, you, when you're taking, coming home, you call your pediatrician, they're there to help you. And, 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 and I, can, you know, I can tell you, Dr. Schwab knows this very well, she can do a very good job of guiding you. And it's true, the athletic trainers, as I said before during my talk, are critical in the good care of high school athletes, college athletes, all athletes. Um, so I think that the, the take home message is, you know, first be happy that, that, that uh, I, I believe sports are good. Um, you, have great, you have great care around you, you're well taken care of. And if you have questions, uh, we're all here to help. Well, I, I will tell you that I've had the luxury of uh, being going around the country in the past two years talking to folks around sports sampling and physical literacy, and I hear a lot of scary talks about concussions. What I really like about your approach is the realist approach that you're giving. Um, this was literally, I, I'm, I'm so sad to see all the empty chairs because it was the best talk on concussions. Sometimes as coaches, we're like, oh, we have to hear this again. We, we, we get it a lot. But um, seriously, this, this was so informative. I found it particularly helpful, even though I'm in this space all the time. And it's an optimistic approach. I think we're talking about how to keep kids well, how to get them well. Um, I love that you're talking about having kids play multiple sports and to keep playing sports, not to avoid it. Um, so if we could give our panelists uh, a round of applause. Thank you very much. And thank you.
and Jason for staying tonight. It's always a good sign when our administrators uh, hang in there with us uh, uh, on a late night. So thank you all and have a great night. Happy Thanksgiving.